I'm Martin and welcome to my Astro Photography channel. If like me you're into photography and you've got a DSLR and tripod something like this and you're interested in taking a picture of space for the very first time from where you live then this video could well be for you. I've spent a number of years learning how to do astrophotography and I'm certainly still on my journey but I decided to make this video to help people who are just starting out to get the best out of the equipment they already have without buying any specialist astrophotography equipment. Before I get stuck into equipment things, I just quickly want to show you this. I downloaded the best Hubble image of the Great Orion Nebula that I could find. And this is what it looks like. Absolutely staggeringly beautiful image. Stunning image. And uh, I want to share with you my first ever astrophotography photograph. And it's not one that I'm proud of at all but it's one that I have kept and I've gone back to and looked at so many times because it's the very first picture I took. I took it with a 400mm lens and it's a single photo, it's a one second exposure time on a very high ISO and, uh, but you can see areas of, ne of nebulosity, you can match up some of the stars and areas of nebulosity with that Hubble image you can actually see nebulosity from that single shot and I often go back to this image to compare where I am now with where I started and I find that really, um, a really rewarding thing to do and to see where I've, where I've, uh, how I've progressed on my journey and just so I can show you uh, where I have got to uh, this is my latest image of, uh, of the Orion Nebula and it's a massive step forward from my previous image of course it's not as good as a Hubble image but it's not about having the best image uh, that exists. It's about what's the best image that you can get with your equipment. And uh, I'm really, I really love this image. I'm really delighted that I can get an image like that now compared to where I started. If all you want is pretty pictures for your wall, you can go and download Hubble images all day long. And astrophotography is not for you. If you want the challenge of getting pictures of space yourself with your own equipment, that's what astrophotography is all about. So let's get started and see what you need to do to set your kit up and take your very first picture of space. So let's start out with the easy bit, the tripod. Obviously you want a nice sturdy tripod, so whatever you've got, hopefully it's reasonably sturdy. I use a ball head tripod, which gives me a lot of freedom of which way the camera is pointing. Yours may be pan and tilt, that's fine. Uh, and uh, I have uh, an Arca Swiss clamp on the top here with a matching Arca Swiss plate, uh, either like this one or uh, uh, on the camera an L bracket uh, which is Arca Swiss as well so that that will attach onto the clamp there and do up the clamp. Various different ways, yours may just have a screw on it that screws into the uh, threaded hole in the bottom of the camera, that's fine. So long as you get a nice sturdy attach and nothing is flopping around or rattling or loose so check that the screws are tight on your tripod, that your clamps are done up tight, that things are firm, that you haven't got any, any uh, slack anywhere there. Uh, and that's basically it for your tripod. The next thing is to make sure you don't have one of these attached to your camera. So if you've got uh, a shoulder strap attached to your camera, take it off. And the main reason is that this thing swings around, blows in the wind, gets caught up on you, caught up in your remote control, whatever. Uh, and moves the camera, not a good thing. So take the camera strap off the camera. So the next thing to think about is how you're actually going to release the shutter to take your shots. And this is a really important thing to get right. There are lots of options. Um, the simplest and most obvious one of pressing the shutter release button is a complete no-no. Uh, the amount of shake you'll put into your camera if you just press the button to take a picture, it is a disaster. So you do not want to be pressing the button to take a picture. So there are a number of different options to consider. If you've got nothing else and you don't want to spend any money at all, you can set your camera to the 10 second a delay that you would use if you were say doing a family portrait with a tripod and you press the button and then run and stand there wait your 10 seconds and then it takes the picture. That allows enough time that you press the button and then after 10 seconds all that wobble has dissipated 
and it then takes the picture. You get away with that, but it's a very slow way of taking pictures because you have to keep waiting 10 seconds before you get another shot. And as we'll come to later, you're going to end up wanting to take quite a lot of shots so that you can stack them together. Uh, so we want a much quicker way of taking pictures than that. Now, the next option is to use a remote of some kind. Now, there are many kinds. Uh, and as you'll see, I've ended up buying lots of different kinds over the years. So the first is these little infrared uh, or radio uh, remote control buttons. On the Canon, this one has to be pointed at the front. It's very fiddly and awkward. You can press the button and take a picture without touching the camera. It's okay, but I don't like it and I wouldn't use it for doing this um, if I could avoid it. Next option is one of these wired remotes. Now, clearly, although you're not pressing the button on the camera, you are attached to the camera by something physical. And that's not a good thing. This can swing around, just like the camera strap, which I've already said you need to take off. You don't really want a cable between you and the camera. Every time you move this, this is going to get tugged on. Your camera is going to move to some extent. You could strap it to the leg with an elastic band or something so that when this moves, you know, it's strapped to the tripod leg to minimize the wobble. It's not ideal, but you might get away with it depending on your focal length. The shorter the focal length, the more likely you are to get away with it. And the shorter you are on exposure time of your shots, more likely you are to get away with it as well. For me, the best thing to do is to invest a very small amount of money in one of these. And this is a wireless remote control. Uh, this particular one is a Pixel Pro TW283. It comes in two parts. You've got the, the handset and then this, this item which actually sits in the uh, flash gun shoe on top of the camera. You screw that in there and then you pop open the port on the side and plug in the cable. flat out of the way, plug in the cable like that. So that sits on the camera and then you simply switch it on, you hold the button there and it switches on and now that camera can be remotely controlled from this handset. Now not only does that require no physical contact at all but this handset you can program to take multiple shots as many as you like, it can control the exposure time, it can define a gap between the end of one shot and the start of the next shot and you can define how many shots you want to take. So once you program that into this little handset, you press play on the handset and then you just leave it and it takes all your photos. You don't have to sit and, uh, and nurse it through all of your shots. So I would recommend that. You don't have to do that for your first ever attempt. If you want to just do uh, the 10 second timer approach, that's fine, but you will eventually get fed up with doing that. Now the other really important thing to point out, regardless of which of those te techniques you use, is that in a DSLR there's a mirror uh, which uh, sits at 45 degrees and reflects the light up into the pentaprism viewfinder so that you can actually see through the lens when you look through the eyepiece. And when you take a shot that mirror uh, lifts up so that the light can get straight through onto the sensor. And that lifting of the mirror actually creates quite a bit of camera shake. Uh, so there is usually an option on a DSLR to have a mirror lock up a delay. Uh, you can set that to up to two seconds and I would always choose to do that so that the mirror moves up and then the camera will wait two seconds before it actually takes the shot so that any wobble caused by the mirror locking up uh, has dissipated before it takes the photo. That's a really good uh, improvement if you do that. Do watch out though if you use this remote control if you want to do for example a four second exposure and you set the camera to do a two second mirror lock up you will need to select six seconds on the handset because the handset knows nothing about the mirror lock up delay on the camera so just a, a word of caution there to, to cater for that for that amount of time. Okay so that is shutter release. Now all cameras of course are different and have different menus and the like so it's all very well if I show you in detail on the menus of my Canon uh, EOS 5DS 
what I would do with that, but I imagine the majority of you won't have the same camera as me. So what I'm going to do, in, uh, rather than take you through on the menus, is actually use uh, some slides to take you through the important uh, things that you need to check and settings that you need to use on your camera. Okay, so you've already put your lens into manual focus and turned off your image stabilizer. You've also already, hopefully, selected the mirror delay, mirror lockup delay, if your camera has that feature, so that you have a, a couple of seconds, hopefully, between your mirror locking up and your shot actually being taken. The next thing to do is to decide whether you're going to use manual mode or bulb mode uh, for the camera control. Now, if you're using either the Pixel Pro TW283 or the Canon, this is the, the wired remote, the Canon TC80N3, these are both uh, program timers, effectively. Uh, so they require you to put the camera in bulb mode, B mode. Uh, if you're going to be using, for example, the 10 second delay uh, function, uh, then you need to be in manual mode. So you need to decide which mode you're going to be and turn your camera's dial or mode setting control uh, to pick that mode uh, as appropriate. You see here on the Canon, if you're in manual mode, you can see the exposure time here of four seconds is displayed. Whereas if you're in bulb mode, then how long the exposure is is a function of how, how long the, uh, the button is, is effectively down for. Uh, so you just see this displayed bulb instead. The 4.5 or 4.0 is the other. The next thing to do is to turn off any high ISO noise reduction or long exposure noise reduction features that your camera may have. Do not want those functions enabled. Next thing is to set your aperture. Now, I tend to always use the maximum aperture so as to let in as much light as possible within the exposure. But if your stars are not quite in perfect focus, then using an f number one or maybe even two stops back from that will help to improve the sharpness of your stars but at the expense of how much light you gather so really it depends how much attention you're going to give to star focus i tend to be very careful with the star focus and then use the lowest possible f number the widest aperture Image quality, very important that you shoot RAW. So you need to find your camera's image quality setting, set it to RAW with no JPEG. You do not want to shoot JPEG. When we do the stacking process, JPEG will mess with that. Uh, and when you choose RAW, in case you're wondering what to do with white balance, white balance becomes irrelevant as soon as you start to shoot RAW. So it doesn't matter what settings you have for white balance at all. The next thing is to decide what ISO to use. Now you can experiment with this, uh, but there is actually a process that you can follow to work out what is the optimum ISO for your camera. And as I explain in a separate video on my channel, uh, a higher ISO actually reduces your dynamic range, but, but a lower ISO will actually have more noise. Now that might sound a the opposite to what you think. If you watch my other video, you'll actually see that that is the case. Uh, so. Uh, you need to know what, what ISO you're going to use, obviously, or make a decision about what to use. If you don't want to watch the other video, just start with ISO 800 and, and see how you get on. Um, but otherwise, you can go to the other video and follow the process. So the next thing is to focus your camera. Now, the, the next three steps, it's important that you do them in the right order. So uh, focus your camera first. So uh, I'm going to show you a quick video of a number of different techniques for focusing your camera. One uses live view and the other uses a thing called a batten off mask, uh, which looks like this, uh, which you put over the end of your lens. Uh, and when you have a bright enough star uh, in the view, it creates a diffraction pattern, which makes it easier to find perfect focus. So here's the video. So we'll start by aiming the camera at a nice bright star. I use Capella or Vega, something like that. And just making some final adjustments to the pointing to get that bright star as close as I can to the center of the view. And I'm in live view here, so I can watch what's happening where the star is on the field view. I'm now going to switch on live view zoom and then move the rectangle until the star is in the rectangle and then press live view zoom button. So I've now gone to six times and I should have centered there, but I actually went to 16 times. Recenter. Get that star in the center as best you can. 
Now if you adjust the focus, you'll see the star turns from a big blob to a small blob and back again. And you're looking to get the, the disk of the star as small as you can. It's often useful to, to see how far you have to move to one side and to the other side to make a large blob of equal size and then find the midpoint between the two. It is a little tricky as you get very close to perfect focus it's very hard to see any change and that's where the Batonov mask becomes useful. So now we have a Batonov mask fitted you see we have a diff diffraction pattern and it, it, it takes the form of an X uh, with an, another a line crossing the X and when you're in perfect focus that additional line passes right through the middle of the X so you have a symmetrical shape and you see here I'm just adjusting the manual focus ring backwards and forwards to show you how it behaves. It's a little difficult as I, was, as I turn the ring of course I'm shaking the camera but uh, a little bit of adjustment either way just persevere looking to get that nice symmetry and I just got close to it there and then deliberately moved off just to show you how it behaves but here we're very close to being in perfect focus and there you go that's almost perfect yeah pretty much perfect focus there using the Batonoff mask. You can only use the Batonoff mask when the star is bright enough. If you find you can't see the diffraction pattern, you have to use the other technique. So once your camera is focused, you then can consider whether you want to fit a dew shield or not. Uh, anything that's outside that sees the whole sky, and obviously if your lens is pointing at the sky, then the glass at the front is, is seeing the sky, uh, will cool uh, uh, with time. And if the surface glass of your lens passes below what's called the dew point, uh, then uh, the moisture in the air will condense onto the surface of your lens and fog it up so that the camera can't see anymore. And as soon as that happens, your images won't be any good. Uh, so uh, you can have a look at the temperature and the uh, humidity. Uh, if you can look up, maybe online, you can look up what the dew point is and see uh, if the, if the ambient temperature outside is uh, low and the humidity is high uh, then uh, it's likely that you're going to end up having a dew problem at some point. So uh, it's a good idea to invest in one of these which is called a dew heater. It's basically a, a band with a velcro strap on it and a heater inside and you wrap it around the front part of your lens. Uh, and you have to be careful not to knock your manual focus ring which may well be underneath it so you have to be very careful when you put that on not to, not to uh, put your focus out and you might want to check your focus after you've fitted uh, the dew heater and uh, the this one is a USB powered one so a USB connector and I use one of these uh, booster packs that you might use to, to boost your your mobile phone charge when you're on the move uh, simply plug that in there and there's an adjuster wheel here set how, uh, how warm the dew heater gets. Uh, that will just gently warm the glass at the front of your lens and prevent dew from building up because the, the glass will no longer pass below the dew point. So uh, not too expensive but a, a really good investment if you get into this and want to try it more but uh, maybe on your first outing don't bother. It does take some time for the glass to get down to be cold enough to dew up and it may not be that humid where you are anyway. So it's just something to be aware of. So the next thing is to frame your shot. And that's simply a case of adjusting the pointing of your camera, point it roughly at the part of the sky that you're interested in imaging, uh, and set an exposure time, maybe five seconds, and just take a shot. Don't worry about star trails, just take a shot, have a look at your preview, uh, and adjust the pointing uh, until you're completely happy with the framing of your shot, and then lock it off. So you're, you're focused, you're, you've framed your shot, and the last thing to do is to choose your exposure time. Now the exposure time is really critical to get right. If it's too short, you won't let in enough light to get a good signal, uh, and uh, if it's too long, you'll get star trails. Assuming you don't want star trails in your shot, uh, you, you want to just, you have to just have the longest exposure time that doesn't quite cause you star trails that, uh, that you don't like. So I'm going to show you a short video now of me experimenting with exposure time at both 400 millimeter. I know I said don't use 400 millimeters, uh, but just for demonstration purposes, 
uh, at 400 millimeters and 100 millimeters to show you how the exposure times uh, uh, can be determined by looking at star trails. Uh, bear in mind this is for my sensor with my pixel sizes your camera may be, may be different so you need to experiment look at your previews of your images you're taking and zoom in on them check that your star trailing is not excessive and that you're happy with your exposure time so here's the video so i'm starting out at 400 millimeter focal length and taking a five second exposure so here's the result of that so i'm now going to play that back and zoom in on it and zoom right in and have a look at how sharp the stars are and you can see that the star trailing 400 mil with a five second shot is really quite bad. So I'm now going to reduce the exposure time to two and a half seconds, so I've halved the exposure time. I'll take another shot, and now by zooming in, we should be able to see that the, the star trails are half as long as they were with the five second exposure. And you can pretty much see that that's the case. But they're still quite ugly, the stars are not sharp. So we clearly need to reduce the exposure time still further. So I'm now going to drop it down to one second. Take the shot again. And we'll play that back. And zoom in again. And now we can pretty much see that the star trails are very minimal, perhaps a tiny little bit on the very smaller stars, but it's looking pretty good. So there's a benchmark of 400 millimeter and one second exposure time is about right for my sensor. So we've now dropped down to 100 millimeters and I'm gonna get really greedy, just for demonstration purposes, and try eight seconds. And bearing in mind that we've reduced the focal length by a factor of four, I've now increased the exposure time by a factor of eight. And of course the result is that I now have ugly star trails back again. So what we'd expect is to need is, is to be able to use a four second exposure time at 100 millimeter focal length that would make sense so we'll try that now take a four second shot Play that back and zoom in. And there we go. And it's looking pretty good. The star trailing is really minimal. So that's the exposure time to use. So that's all the setup information. What you need to do now is make sure you've got charged up batteries, plenty of space on your memory card, on your camera. Uh, wait for a nice clear night, preferably with light wind or no wind at all. And also, it's better if there's less moon in the sky, or preferably no moon in the sky. The brighter the moon lights up the sky, the more that will uh, spoil your pictures. Uh, and to choose your shot, what direction you're going to look, uh, what you're going to image. Uh, you may like to download Stellarium. To download Stellarium, go to Google and type in Stellarium. And click on uh, this Stellarium astronomy software link. And it brings up the Stellarium website. Now, if you're Windows 64 bit, for example, select here, but there are various other versions for different operating systems. Uh, and there's also actually a web based version if you want to use that. Uh, but I am using Windows uh, on a 64 bit machine, so I've downloaded the Windows 64 bit version. So I'm going to show you uh, what the main things that you need to set up. Stellarium. So basically you roll the mouse wheel and you zoom in and out on the sky, you can drag the sky around. That's a little confusing as to which way is up here because we're not seeing the ground, but we can go into the sky and viewing options, landscape, and put a zero horizon on, and uh, then switch on the ground, just down here, ground. So I now can see the ground. And uh, it's useful if you can see the uh, cardinal points. That's this option here to turn the north, south, east, west cardinal points on. You can see this is south. Now, the grid in the sky, there's two grids available. One is an azimuth grid, 
uh, where basically the top of the top of the grid is straight up. That's quite useful. The other one is uh, equatorial grid, which we won't uh, worry about right now. So the next thing to do is to set up your location. So on the left hand side here, go to the location window and you can search for your location. So let's say you were in London, for example, you can just type London uh, and it'll come up with London, Britain. You just select London, Britain. Uh, if you want to, you can click use current location as default, uh, which I'm not going to do. But um, we're now seeing what the sky looks like from London. Now, on the bottom here, these are the controls for time. This strange looking symbol here, uh, when you click on that, it takes you to uh, the current date and time. So this is kind of live, if you like. So here is the 19th of December 2020, 16.49 and 20 seconds. Um, so this is what the sky looks like now. Now, if we put the, the atmosphere, if I turn it off, you see just the space. If you put it on, it sort of shows you how bright the sky is right now. So if I now advance time, this kind of fast forward looking button here, if I, every time you click it, the speed at which it's fast forwarding increases. And you can go a bit crazy and uh, increase much too fast. I'm just at the uh, spinning really crazily. So I'll just bring it back to now. And then I'm going to advance it slowly. You can see that the sun's gone down and it's now dark. So let's say we're looking for the Great Orion Nebula. Now, in fact, the constellation of Orion is just here, and it's rising in the east. So if you're in the northern hemisphere, you'd expect it to rise in the east. I'm at about 51 degrees north. You can turn on the constellations. So there's this constellation lines uh, button here. Quite useful if you enable that and see these patterns. And you're looking for this distinctive uh, pattern with Orion. Four stars. I like to think of it as the shoulders the legs, the belt, with three stars forming Orion's belt, and then the bow, sort of a bit like a man standing uh, with a, a bow and arrow. And in fact, there's uh, some constellation art. There's not actually with a bow here, but um, that's the, the constellation of Orion. Now, the Orion Nebula, which is a great target to look for uh, for your first shot, is in the dagger just below Orion's belt. So if I zoom in there, this is where uh, the, the Orion Nebula is. So hopefully that will help you to know how high in the sky, at what time, and in what direction uh, to look. So here, for example, here, this would be at just after 8 p.m. tonight. Uh, and you can see here the as out, the out is 16 degrees. So it would be 16 degrees above the horizon uh, uh, in the southeast. And as we go through the evening, I'll just uh, speed up time. You see it, it's, it climbs uh, up and moves around towards the south. And it will cross what's called the meridian, which is when it's exactly due south. Uh, it's approximately uh, 11.40 tonight. And then it will continue on, um, but falling gradually until it sets sometime later. Uh, you can search for items, so if you go on the left here and click on search window, for example if you wanted to go after Andromeda, that's M31. The Andromeda Galaxy, so there's the Andromeda Galaxy. It's a very large object in the sky as well, it's another one you could go for. Um, it shows you whereabouts to look in the sky, so if I were to look now, for example, uh, it's pretty much almost straight up actually, very high in the sky, uh, but it's not quite dark enough yet, so if I advance time a little, you can see that by approximately 6pm, it's almost straight up. Uh, you can get your bearings with respect to Cassiopeia, which is the sort of W-shaped constellation here, uh, it's down to the right of the, of the monkey W shape, so that's the way of finding Andromeda. If you've got a nice short focal length like 100 millimeters, you shouldn't struggle too much to find these objects. The other thing, of course, that can be interesting to photograph is the Milky Way. Um, now, the Milky Way uh, is essentially like a band right across the sky. Um, 
on the Milky Way is essentially this band that runs all the way across here. So if you want to make the Milky Way easier to see on Stellarium, go across to the left here, click on Sky and Viewing Options window, and then on the Sky tab here, make sure you've got Milky Way brightness uh, saturation ticked, and then you can increase here the brightness of the Milky Way until it's nice and visible. Uh, you can adjust the saturation as well if you wish to. So we can now see where the Milky Way is at any given time. So if you wanted to photograph the Milky Way um, you know, at 6.30 p.m., you would have to look towards the east to see the Milky Way. But the core is over in the west. That's if I just turn the ground off. And actually see that the core is below the core, core is here below the horizon. Not a great time of year for photographing the Milky Way just a plan. So that's Stellarium. Hopefully that will help you to know where to look and when uh, and to choose a help you choose a target to photograph. Once you're ready, get outside and take as many shots as you can, uh, maybe at least a hundred shots. Uh, over a period of an hour or two and once you've got those shots together it's time to come inside get warm and uh, maybe the next day to process them so I'm going to go out and do the same I'm going to go and shoot the Great Orion Nebula and get at least 100 shots at 100 millimeter and I'll come back and join you in a minute when I've done that by the magic of YouTube So it took a while to get some clear sky, but I got some shots of Orion. Got over 400 shots actually in one second on my new Canon R5. I decided to change camera. One issue I had was that that camera raw files are CR3, which are not great for stacking. So I converted them to PNG uh, using Photoshop, uh, Adobe uh, Camera Raw. Uh, so uh, next thing to do is to install Deep Sky Stacker. It's a stacking program. It's free. Available online, so go to Google and type Deep Sky Stacker. Go to the Deep Sky Stacker website, where you can click download and download the latest version, which at the time of recording this was 4.2.5. So once you've downloaded and installed that, you run it up, and it looks like this. And you click Open Picture Files and select all of your photos you want to stack, and click Open and after a few seconds those will appear in your list and note that each file in the list has a checkbox on the left hand side so you select one picture and I'm going to draw the mid-range slider down so I can actually see the picture so here's the picture of Orion's belt and the Orion nebula notice the corners are darkened this is called vignetting it happens with all cameras and uh, it's something you would uh, ultimately calibrate out but I'm not going to do that today but just zooming in, this is a single shot showing you what the Orion Nebula looks like on that single shot. And now you would go through each photo, just preview each photo, make sure it hasn't got something horrible like a cloud, an aeroplane or a satellite uh, spoiling it. If it does, you can right click on it and remove from list. And make sure that all the pictures in your list have got decent looking images. I've already done that for this list, uh, so I know that I've got 100 good files here. So having done that, you click check all on the left hand side to make sure that each one is ticked in the list and then click register checked pictures. Now the next thing to do is to set the threshold for star detection. There's a slider on the advanced tab and you can adjust the slider and click compute number of stars, detected stars. And you want that to be somewhere between 100 and 200. So you can increase or decrease the threshold, you decrease it to see more stars increase it you'll see less stars once you're happy uh, make sure that the stack after registering is ticked if you know all your pictures are good you can use 100% of the pictures if you think there still might be some bad ones in there you can maybe say 90% you'll also see a warning about the fact that you've not got any dark 
flat or dark flat offset or bias files, which are all to do with calibration. But today I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do any calibration at all. Uh, so we can just click OK. And the registration or registering process and stacking process begins. Can take quite a long time. Obviously, the more pictures you have, the longer it's going to take. So I'm going to dramatically speed it up for the purposes of this video uh, so we get to the end result as quickly as possible. So we'll just wait a few seconds as we go through that, and I'll be back with you in a second. So once the processing is finished, you'll see the final image uh, loads back in. Actually, has already saved it as an autosave a TIFF file. Loads it back in, and you can have a quick go at just stretching it to see uh, what you've got. So you can zoom in by rolling the mouse wheel. And then you can use this a set of sliders at the bottom to uh, just stretch it a little bit. So they're unlinked at the moment, so you can separately move the middle slider on red, green, and blue. You want to put them at the bottom, sort of bottom half-ish of the, the steepest part of the curve that you see there. You can link them together with the link settings tick box if you want to move them all together. I like to move them one at a time. And once you're done, click apply. And you can now see roughly what the stretched image looks like. But we're not going to do our post-processing of this stacked image here. We're not even going to save the changes we just made. So uh, you can play with the saturation as well. Uh, but this is really just to have a quick look-see uh, before you get into the next stage of the image processing. So basically, once you've done that, you want to do Save Picture to File. Choose a folder to put it in, give it a file name. And you're going to store that picture. I'm then going to use uh, Adobe Photoshop and Lightroom uh, after Photoshop to do the final processing of this image. So the file is just saving. And that's done and we can close Deep Sky Stacker. So I've opened the file in Adobe Photoshop. The first thing to do is image adjustment levels. And we're going to draw the central slider down until it's just at the top of the main bulk of the histogram. And click OK. Now we can change the mode. We need to do image mode 16 bits per channel to change it from 32 to 16 bits per channel. And when you do this, you get a menu appear in which you need to choose exposure and gamma. And click OK. Now that it's uh, 16 bits per channel, we can use all the functions. So image adjust levels. And now we're going to uh, adjust the black level. So this is the leftmost uh, slider. And you can see that what, it ha what happens as you move the black level, you actually darken the background. But if you raise it too high, you actually kill all of your details. You need to be very careful not to slide it too far to the right. So now we're going to do a curved adjustment. And you can see that the bulk of our histogram is in the middle there. Our stars are at the very top end, and our very faint details are at the bottom end. So the, the parts of the histogram that are hard to see uh, are actually very important. I do a small S-shaped stretch here. The steeper the line is and the, where it goes through the bulk of the histogram, the more it's going to stretch. But you do not want to go too high at the top end, otherwise you'll blow out your stars. So now I'm going to do a levels adjustment, so image adjust levels. Just pull the black level in just a little bit, not too much, and click OK. Now I'm going to do a, a basic crop, just to get rid of the artifacts around the edges, so which were to do with the stacking process. So we'll select the crop area, and once you're happy, click the tick to apply the crop. And now we can adjust the zoom, so we can see clearly what we're doing. So I'm now going to do a curve adjustment. And you can see the histograms, the ground is gradually getting wider and further to the left. But I'm still going to do a little S shape, a very gentle S shape and curve stretch. And now another levels adjustment. And we'll just look at pulling in the black level. Now at this point, we can start to see that there is still some vignetting affecting this image. As I slide that up, the corners are getting dark first. And this uh, this can create difficulties. 
we're going to come back and deal with that in a moment. So just another another little stretch. Just a little S-shaped stretch. And then we'll do levels again. You can really see those top two corners are looking very dark. We really do have a gradient in the background due to the vignetting of the shot that is going to make life difficult now as we try to uh, adjust the black level. So I'm going to deal with that in a cheeky way using a thing called Gradient Exterminator from uh, RC Astro. And you can download this as a plugin online. But it's not particularly cheap. And if you learn how to make flats and use them in your deep sky stacking, you won't hopefully need to do this too much. But I'm going to use this Gradient Exterminator. I'm going to select the area I don't want to affect. So the, the most interesting part of the image and this select inverse of so I've selected everything but that area and then I'm going to use the gradient exterminator with coarse and medium settings click OK and after a few seconds the background will adjust itself and you notice there's been a bit of a uh, color balance change there as well so now we've done that you can go back to the levels adjustment change the black level and you can see we've got a much more uniform background that's really helping again being very careful not to kill too much of the detail we'll do another curves adjustment another little stretch there and then back in and do another levels adjustment so you're just going to check what's happening in the vicinity of the Orion Nebula. I'm going to make sure we're not killing that faint detail too much. So you can see you can move it up a fair amount without destroying that detail too much. So back to full zoom. And now do the levels adjustment. Just darkening that background a little. Not going too far, hopefully. Now one thing we haven't done is to increase the saturation. So I'm going to do image adjust saturation and lift the saturation just to bring a bit more of the colour out in the scene. It's very easy to go too far with the saturation as well and you'll soon see the problems when you move that too far to the right. But that's not looking too bad now. And we're getting close uh, to being ready to take it out of Photoshop. You can actually see the flame nebula and just a hint of the horse head nebula as well. Uh, next to the leftmost star of Orion's belt. I'm just going to do one more gradient correction here. I think I've still got a little bit of vignetting towards the corners. I'm going to be a bit more aggressive and use medium and high this time. Really try and flatten out those slightly darkened corners. You can see that's worked very well indeed. Okay. Uh, thinking about raising that black level a little more. It's very dangerous at this point because I don't want to destroy too much detail. So really just uh, some last final tweaks before I take this to Lightroom. That's looking okay. I've still got the, uh, the faint nebulosity visible. So I've not gone too aggressive. So now I'm going to do File, Export, Export As. Which brings up a window. Um, format at the top right there is chosen to be JPEG. Now I'm going to export that to a specific folder, give it a name. Orion image one and save. Okay, so now we can switch over to Lightroom and I've imported the image that I just exported from Photoshop and here it is in Lightroom now if we zoom in the first ob an obvious problem we can see is noise in the image even though we've stacked 100 one second images we still have significant noise so we can go and adjust the luminance slider on noise reduction and this is a very sensitive and very effective slider and the luminance and the detail are very important to get right uh, more luminance you kill the noise but you also destroy detail if you 
choose to preserve more detail with the detail slider, uh, you actually leave more noise. So it's a real balancing act between noise and detail, and it really is down to your own judgment. You can also adjust things like the clarity and the saturation. Uh, and this is really in the domain of art at this point. You're deciding how you want your image to look. There's no right or wrong, it's just what you like. Uh, so you can really have a play and see how you'd like to finalize that image. Um, set the black level and the shadows level as well uh, to set the background. Don't make it too dark. You don't want to lose that, that faint red um, hue that you have from the strong hydrogen alpha emissions just under Orion's belt. So there we go. There's our final image. I uh, hope you've uh, followed that. It's been a fairly long video, but uh, hopefully informative. And, uh, and I'd really like to hear from you if you use this video to go out and get your first image of space. It'd be, it'd be really good to uh, hear about how you got on and whether you found these, uh, these tips useful. I'll leave you with the final image, which is actually a stack from 405 one second shots. Thanks for watching. Clear skies. See you next time.